Okay, want to take a look at some of the other concepts that are going to be important to us when it comes to dealing with the application-centric infrastructure and the way that we're going to be interacting with it. Now, if I were to take this entire blackboard and want to put a header on it, what I'm going to be discussing right now is the idea of ACI logical constructs. Now, ACI logical constructs actually come to us in a number of forms. And to be perfectly honest, as I said earlier, the highest component or the highest portion of this is what we refer to as the APIC policy. Now, when we look at APIC policy, there are a lot of things that we need to understand about it. Inside of the ACI, the policy model manages the entire fabric. And we've seen how that works through the deployment of those core fabric services. And we also saw how we can do that when manipulating access policies. Now, that doesn't stop there. The, the policy model manages the entire fabric. That's going to include the infrastructure, authentication, security, services, applications, as well as even diagnostics. However, in order to be able to do that, the APIC policy has to define a series of logical constructs that we're going to actually use to define how the model is going to meet the needs that need to be defined in the fabric. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using APIC policies to define functions. Now, from the perspective of implementation, this is where we get the idea of a software-defined infrastructure, even if we consider the fact that it still uses the idea of hardware behind the scenes. Now, the highest level construct that we have to deal with inside of APIC policy is going to be categorized as a tenant. Now I mentioned the fact that tenants are kind of like containers. So in other words, I could create T in Terry as a tenant and I could create T in David as a tenant. And these are going to be separate containers and these separate containers are going to need to contain their own logical functions. So as an example, if, if I wanted to have, say, for instance, a layer two broadcast domain in my tenant, my tenant would actually be containerized and separate from David's tenant and he could have his own broadcast domain. In fact, we could even call them the exact same thing, but by virtue of the fact that we're operating in separate tenants, they're going to be isolated from each other. So a tenant is basically, at the end of the day, an isolation construct. The thing that I use to compare it to inside of normal networking would be the concept of a virtual device context inside of a 7K. It gives me the capability of being able to split a physical device into multiple logical devices. So in a way, a tenant gives me that exact same functionality. Now when we start looking at this, the tenant will also then turn around and contain a series of other constructs. So the first construct that my tenants are going to contain, whether I'm talking about tenant Terry or whether I'm talking about tenant Dave or some other tenant, it's also important to understand that we inherit three tenants by default as we've already seen. The tenant is ultimately going to make reference to other logical constructs, one of which is probably the most fundamental that we're going to be dealing with and that is going to be the idea of an EPG or an end point group. Now endpoint groups are very very important for us. First of all, they are named objects. 
Now it's a named object and actually to be perfectly honest it would be more accurately be referred to as a named group of objects thus the group in the name endpoint group and what it does is it basically aggregates a series of related endpoints. So as an example if I had three devices that were all part of the HR department, the human resources department, it would be very easy to take those three devices and categorize them into an HR endpoint group. And then what I could do is I could utilize that endpoint group to apply policy to all three of these devices that are going to be participating in that particular business function. Now keep in mind, when I create these, when I create endpoint groups, they could actually be using static mechanisms or dynamic mechanisms to assign memberships. So these particular devices could actually be assigned statically or dynamically into and endpoint group. Our primary focus in our initial walkthroughs is going to be through the concept of static assignment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to go ahead and box this in to containerize it. So tenants contain or are going to make be a re making reference to other logical constructs. All of these are logical constructs and EPGs are just groupings of end points. Now it should stand to reason that below here is where we're going to actually find end points. End points could include things like servers, virtual machines, it could include storage components, It could include what would be things like routers and switches that I may use for ISP access, Internet Service Provider access. It could include even clients that could need or rely on any of these underlying other services. So it could be a client. Say, for instance, what am I describing? Let's say I'm describing a desktop virtual infrastructure solution those would still be categorized as endpoints. Now these endpoint groups that we are defining are not the only logical constructs that are going to be referenced under a tenant. Another construct is going to be what is referred to as a bridge domain. Now a bridge domain is not a VLAN. We've already said that. A bridge domain is basically, at the end of the day, a broadcast domain. But it does provide me some Layer 3 functions. Well, a lot of people ask immediately, well, how does a bridge domain provide me Layer 3 functions? Well, a bridge domain is going to be where I'm going to create and assign subnets that are going to be utilized in my configuration and as a part of that subnet creation I can also configure a default gateway. So that means that I can create a series of subnets. In fact it's safe to say that broadcast domains are actually containers that one define a broadcast domain and they also contain subnets. So I could write in here I have subnet A and I have subnet B. So I can have more than one subnet inside of a single bridge domain. I could also have more than one bridge domain with more than one subnet. So again it's just a logical construct that I'm going to use to define network functions so that I can actually then turn around and assign policies to those constructs. Now it doesn't end there because the next thing that we need to also pay attention to is, is that we are going to have another element and sometimes you will see this annotated as a context but the more 
common term that's becoming in use now is going to mirror a networking term that everybody should be relatively familiar with already and that's going to be the idea of a virtual routing and forwarding construct. Now when we start looking at this this also gives us the capability of being able to provide functions. Now I'm drawing what are referred to as network functions in yellow here. So when we look at this bridge domain, this is typically going to be thought of as a layer two construct. A virtual routing and forwarding construct, routing and forwarding should immediately evoke the vision of layer three functionality. And in fact, it does actually extend to me, and I'll go ahead and write virtual routing and forwarding. It does immediately evoke the idea of being able to send information between networks and it does so by providing unique layer 3 forwarding functions which is why I like the idea of calling it a VRF far more than I like calling it a context. In fact, it gets it got its name context because it is actually going to be using the idea of VRF context and the name that you're going to call it. So as an example, this could be Terry VRF or it could be David VRF. Now, this creates a unique layer three forwarding, whoops, Sorry about that, guys. A unique layer three forwarding domain. Now, that's one function. I'll go ahead and put a little bullet here because I didn't want to write too far over because we have a fourth construct that I've got to write in here. So I get a unique layer three forwarding domain for every virtual routing and forwarding instance I create. And a tenant can have more than one VRF. But it's also important to understand that VRFs actually are containers, but those containers actually contain bridge domains. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to look at the other element that is brought to me via a context. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make reference to the fact that bridge domains reside inside of the container that I create for a VRF. Now, the other thing that we go in and we look at here is, is that VRFs are going to be where I'm going to define the relation to an application profile. So normally what we're going to find here, this is going to be where I'm going to apply policies. The third bullet here is, is that VRFs are going to contain bridge domains. So there's a direct correlation between these two logical constructs. In fact, it's important to understand that this virtual routing and forwarding layer 3 domain that gets created is going to be providing layer 3 and unique layer 3 forwarding functionality specifically for the bridge domains that are created as part of its construction. So remember, like I said, it contains bridge domains and I can have multiple VRFs and I can have multiple bridge domains inside of a VRF. Now, the fourth construct here that I'm going to need us to make certain that we understand how it functions is referred to as a contract. Now, contracts exist to allow objects to communicate with one another because we have to keep in mind that in all of this configuration, we operate in a zero trust fabric. In fact, by default, the only thing that can ever talk to one another, so we'll say... Um, endpoint groups, so devices, endpoints in, in, inside of endpoint groups basically are permitted to talk to one another. So it's almost like a permit any. Now I could actually bypass that through an idea called micro segmentation. But right now, for the purposes of our conversations, keep in, keep in mind that the, once I define an endpoint group and I place in, devices inside of that endpoint group, they will immediately be able to talk to one another provided we have built the fabric correctly. 
So that begs the question, why do I need a contract? Well, a contract actually defines <clears throat> the interaction between endpoint groups. Now in class the question was asked, well, how can I allow tenants to communicate between each other inside of the same fabric? Well, what I do is I build an endpoint group in my tenant, and what I do is I create a contract that, that I can use to share that specific endpoint group between tenants. And if we were to really look at it just from an application perspective, what we do is we can use a contract to determine how applications are going to use the network. And that's what I'm going to go through here. I'm going to say it also defines how apps use the network. So you can see here we have these primary constructs that we have to get our mind wrapped around almost immediately because these are going to become the key components that we're going to use in order to be able to build our fabric. Now what I want to do is I want to look at each one of these, each of these in turn. So first what we're going to do is we're going to need to look at the idea of a tenant. What we're going to do is we're going to discuss it, then what we're going to do is we're going to build a tenant, and then what we'll do is we'll move through each of these individual logical constructs because the thing that we have to keep in mind is, is there is this concept or this idea of containerization. So the topmost object is going to be a tenant. Tenants actually contain virtual routing and forwarding instances. Inside of a virtual routing and forwarding instance, I define bridge domains. Inside of a bridge domain, I define a subnet. Now that addresses everything except contracts, and it also really pretty much defines everything that I would think that I would need in order to provide some type of abstracted network functionality. And that's what these all define. They are going to define the network features that I'm going to be virtualizing inside of a specific tenant. So that's going to be my layer 3 functionality, my layer 2 functionality, and my network or subnetwork identifications. So when we start looking at this, this governs the network configuration, but keep in mind we still have to define how we're going to implement the behavior. And that's going to be another element that we're going to discuss when we hit the next video where we discuss the concept of tenants. We'll actually discuss it and then what we'll do is we will build them. With that being said, I'll see you guys in that video.